So this is going to be our uh, last uh, large group activity today. Am I right, dealing with on that? And what we are going to do is go back to that case study that Russ presented to us at the beginning of the day. You do have a package that you received this morning. If you could look for that, that would be wonderful. It should look something like a few PowerPoint slides. And then it has also a table within the PowerPoint slide. Let me show you what it should look like. Something like this, blank. Could you come? Yes, yes, the small group exercise package, please. And uh, you also received separately in the dark of the presentations a case study description that was separately distributed this afternoon. You might want to look for that as well. Um, what we will ask you to do is uh, I will just remind you of the activity and uh, let you form small groups. We were thinking of not moving too much around. We have limited time. Please try to create groups about five people per group just around you. Work together. The idea will be to review the case study just to remember what uh, study we are talking about. And then think about the REAM uh, constructs. We provided you with some checklist for study or intervention planning for REAM. You can use that. I'm also going to pull up the original REAM uh, definitions to help you. Please work on the um, table and try to develop, not as fully developed, but more bullet point type of ideas for how to address a certain aspect of REAM from a planning perspective. So how would you improve reach as you are planning for it, and how would you evaluate reach in the context of this study? So try to make it specific to the study, but also think about the general kind of definitions of reach, effectiveness, adoption, implementation, and maintenance. We will ask the groups to report back in a kind of a random way. I will not tell you how, so you can all work on everything. And then uh, we do a little report back, and then Russ is going to actually tell us what happened in this study and what kind of results they found. And then we are going to be done and break up to three groups for this next session. So uh, just moving back, um, everyone has, I hope, the materials. Uh, we are going to look at the Be Fit, Be Well study. You have the description of the study in front of you. This is this uh, randomized trial that you are going to read about. And uh, please use the additional checklist that we provided, and I will have the REAM constructs here. Do you have any questions that the large group should hear about the actual study or the process or the... Oh, wonderful. Just, just a quick uh, question, or uh, just to reiterate differently, you have two assignments. One of them is think about re-aim for planning. So if you wanted to maximize reach or you wanted to maximize adoption, what would you do? And again, just, just bullet points. We, we're not interested in the perfect study, so don't take forever, but ju just bullet points, as Borsica said. And then secondly, for evaluation, what would the measure be if you wanted to measure? implementation or maintenance in this study. What would you use? Uh, Borsica and I and Elaine and maybe a couple others will circulate. Joanne could circulate too. If she's not in a group, she knows it about as well as we do. Uh, or Ross. But raise your hand if you have questions. But in general, don't get hung up on the details. Remember, this is a community health center, primary care-based obesity or weight reduction intervention using community health workers. And if you don't have the information, just, just make up something. You can raise your hand. It's not about the exact deal or the perfect answer. It's just using this framework. So if you have to have some information, just say, well, we assume that you know, there's this many community health workers or if you don't, if you don't have info. But it's just to, to get down and get, you know, roll up your shirt sleeves and get down some experience trying to use it. Wonderful. And we will give till, so you have a time, to 3 o'clock. So about a little over 20 minutes. Just you know, and if we're screaming, oh my gosh, that's not enough time, we can adjust. Um, but it, it, again, it's just trying to get your thought process thinking through how you would apply. So please form the groups and uh, let us know of any questions. Okay. 
So I hope that the exercise was somewhat helpful for you. We would appreciate feedback on the exercise itself. What I am going to do is um, go down to this lovely table. I guess I have to go back to my other slides. And uh, I will ask you, I will ask you know, each group to volunteer for one construct. I would like to ask you to provide one item for planning, one for evaluation, and then ask one question that came up as you were working on the framework. So if you didn't have any questions, make them up now. Uh, I'm sure you can do that. I'm just going to go down to that table that you were working on. And uh, Russ is going to be the one responding to your questions. I am just going to direct this. So the first uh, construct was REACH. And so we are looking for uh, volunteers, a group that would provide us one item for the planning or maximizing REACH, one for evaluation, and then a question. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so our group, we were considering ways that, uh, as opposed to what we were reading, that the reach could have been optimized if we were doing it over. And we thought that these were all um, clinic sites in the Boston area so that you could expand the reach by geographic area to include other types of settings, rural, urban, suburban. You could also expand the reach in that way by looking at different types of health systems. These were all community health centers. You could look at HMOs or other types of health centers as well. Um, and then in terms of how the measure, how uh, reach would be measured, our proposed outcomes, we thought it was important to use mixed methods to uh, assess the reach, both in terms of the percent of the individuals who were participating based on a valid denominator of all eligible at the sites, not just those who volunteered, and also to provide, um, to use qualitative methods to assess the, the choice of the delivery mode. There was the IVR or the print methods or the, um, uh, the online, and we thought that people might have different reasons that they wanted to do one type or another that could be relevant to other settings where you were going to have these types of interventions. Mm -hmm. We, um, well, I guess, I don't know if this is a question so much, but when we were initially looking at the effectiveness and thinking about things to put in there, what we started thinking about instead was um, fidelity or things that are more implementation issues, how well um, things were delivered with fidelity. But the reason we started thinking about them there and had to recategorize them ultimately is we thought that would very much influence effectiveness. So I think. That raises the um, issue that some of these constructs are uh, interdimensional or, or have relevance in more than one place. I think you did a great job. And by the way, I'm not the only person to answer. So really, please, Borsica or Elaine or whatever. And you know, I'm sure I'll you know mess up at least two things or miss four opportunities to comment here. I think you did a great job. Let me start with the last issue that you brought up. Part of the purpose of this exercise is to see, and particularly if you had more time, is these are not orthogonal independent dimensions. And often what you do on one, and you gave a great example, but what you're doing is increasing reach, which is defined as the individual participants. And particularly uh, this we're focused on low income, the health disparity issues there. The same thing you're doing, expanding that, is also going to increase adoption or the number of settings that you're doing. So that's a good example. Unfortunately, sometimes one thing that you do, like particularly with effectiveness, which is the way many of us are trained to increase the effectiveness, and again, the best way to do that often is to have a real intensive program. Well, that is going to increase in uh, effectiveness generally, but what else does it do? it usually decreases your reach that you're having because fewer people are that motivated or can, can do that. But I thought you did a great example, and I think the mixed methods is perfect. Great. Anyone, uh, any questions related to reach? Then uh, I'm going to, yes. That came up in our group is um, in the planning process, and I suppose this would work for adoption as well, but definitely for reach is to early on to consider um, like a community advisory board or finding out in the community how to reach, you know, what their preferred methods of mm -hmm. finding out about health information or, you know, how, how they're utilizing the, the clinic. Are they, 
low utilizers of the clinic or do they find their health somewhere else? Like we mentioned, the nine health fairs here. A lot of mm -hmm. people go there to get their lab work and things like that. Um, so, uh, um, so that came up for us is just thinking about some type of an advisory capacity and doing some of that work ahead of time. And I think that's a great point also, uh, how you can use engagement and partnership things on an ongoing basis too. The other thing that you can use, depending you know on the system and the data, sometimes you can use rapid data like to answer your questions about who's coming and who isn't, and then to do some iterative changes. You know, if you find out, like I'm just going to make up for older adults, often for physical activity, it's real hard to get men there, as you probably know. Now, when, but then if you find that with your data, then maybe you can do you know an adaptation or something to try and address that great let's move to the next construct of eff effectiveness I'm sorry um, which group Joanne's group is volunteering to give us an example of planning and evaluation. Hi. so our group was worried about um, unintended consequences and interference with work or family. So we um, discussed the, pos the potential of the incongruent practices of the program with family and cultural values. And so with that, we were thinking about um, measures on the next box as um, looking at um, interval focus groups to check in with the group and make sure that, you know, get feedback qualitatively, um, as well as maybe in the program bring in a component of family engagement and do a family engagement measurement um, as, as a potential um, solution. And a question or a challenge, anything around effectiveness? Any trouble applying it or confusion? Yes, all of above. <laughs> <laughs> anything you'd like to share? <laughs> How about just the notion that I think the underlying question I heard is around, please add, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. But the challenge is um, the potential for uh, conflict in a family if we are um, recommending behaviors that don't fit within the cultural context. So yep. that's the challenge we were trying to um, address and get some information about with these yep. approaches. Great. I think that's super. Um, I forget how many years ago it was now, maybe Borsica remembers or something, where we added to effectiveness unanticipated consequences. Um, but I think it was a, a, a useful lesson learned that we did because often what we've learned, particularly sometimes the harder we push and particularly if we don't think through issues like this, we can see unintended consequences both with individual focus things and often particularly with policy issues can have unanticipated consequences. So I think that's a, a great pickup there. Uh, for the whole group, now, if, this, if you're going to submit this as an NIH grant, okay, what would be your primary outcome for, for effectiveness? Again, remember what you had about the study. Anybody? Weight loss. And since they also had hypertension, probably also, and again, you can argue if you can have two primaries, but definitely weight loss, then probably something about blood pressure, blood pressure control also. What's different about REAIM and most implementation science models, though, is it's a little broader than that. So we also do want to look for unanticipated consequences and spill off and issues like that. And particularly because of this question, we may also want to drill down more on the who's benefiting and who isn't, who's not benefiting, too to address, address the disparities issues. Who would be the group uh, talking about adoption? So we were basically conceptualizing adoption as sort of the system, on the system level, their ability to actually try this out, um, and also sort of at the patient level. Um, but just primarily we were thinking, you know, engaging um, the systems that you're targeting, you know, healthcare systems and the, and the community, um, at the you know the forefront and actually giving them having them go through the inter intervention and go through the pieces and have them put in have give input into sort of feasibility and whether or not um, this could work in their setting um, so that was sort of one starting point um, and then sort of throughout um, just through formative evaluation are there things that you could potentially create to make it easier and sort of more general as to different settings. If you can create toolkits and all they have to do is sort of adapt portions of it, are they more willing to give it a shot um, in that particular setting? So, And then for evaluation? Um, um, just uh, basically whether or not, I think this would be 
sort of an interesting empirical question to think about how you could even uh, look at this within the trial, but if you even had some sites where you had some of these strategies and some sites that didn't, you could actually um, see if that, you know, led to, you know, greater adoption versus not. Um, and that's sort of kind of messing with the design a little bit, but that would be um, interesting to look at. Um, but yeah, you'd be basically looking at the percentage or number of people who would be willing to um, init initiate or uh, try the intervention. And then did you have any questions from the adoption uh, perspective or any other groups uh, came up with adoption? We have many questions for adoption, it sounds like. There's, did you, uh, yeah, this is actually something that I kind of started questioning and I question a lot when I'm like thinking about this type of research. Um, to think about it just on different levels. So I know that depending on what you read, adoption is sort of like thought about more at the sort of system or provider level, um, but that the, it really actually is the patient level as well. Um, but sort of when you get into some of these trials, um, the focus is more on the actual provider or the delivery system versus the patient. And sort of how often do you mix both types of outcomes and what's, yeah. Do you want to answer to that, Russ, and then we take the two other adoption questions? Just, yeah, and then should we go to the wrap-up? I'm just concerned about the timer. Do you want to go through all the components? I think that we can go through the components and then uh, the wrap-up, we would keep it very, very short. Is that okay? Okay, sure, yeah. Or let, let's maybe pick one more dimension. Okay. You think about which one. Okay. Uh, I do want, I think you brought up a number of key issues that are common challenges. The, the core concepts, and you addressed them there, are it's the level of participation and the representativeness mm -hmm. of who it is. And the other thing is adoption is almost inherently multi-level, if yeah. you will. Having said that, there's some arbitrariness to it, admittedly. And it's, it's just arbitrary, but what we've done in REAIM is when the issues apply to, if you will, the end user or the consumer, or in this case, the patient, we've just somewhat arbitrarily said, that's reach if okay. you're kind of saying there, and then the other levels, just to separate that from the broader levels of the setting or the system and the provider or the staff team. Okay. Again, it's arbitrary. The issues are the same, and you've mm -hmm. addressed them. So at some point, it doesn't matter that much. It's that you're thinking about all of them, but, but we've kind of just separated out the setting and the, the team or the staff or the, the sometimes we use the... Uh, bad word intervention agent that okay. always confuses MDs what we're talking they think we're talking about a drug but uh, but that that for adoption but I, but I think you got the points down and uh, there were some questions of adoption and I will actually let Russ then wrap up because that would give you more time do you think okay. yes one thing that um, that our group was talking about in the context of adoption is uh, challenges or barriers that we thought might be experienced by the population that you were targeting. Like it mentioned specifically that the intervention used uh, e-health components, and this was occurring in a low-income, low-resource setting. So acceptability of that or availability of those uh, those resources and the support for that among the community, and the, the patients, and also among the uh, staff who would be supporting that at the clinic level was something we were wondering if that would be a, a burden that would influence adoption. Those are great implementation issues, and I'll get in and the answers the way we did to some of it. You're right. Just in terms of re -AMEs, for the ones with the patient, we generally talk about those as being barriers or issues for reach the patient. But again, you're absolutely right for the setting. Too, if they want to do that, then that would be adoption issues. But you're right to think about that, and I'll show you a little bit how we addressed it. Not that this is right or wrong uh, either. But uh, on these slides, and we'll make these available, I'm just going to touch uh, a couple of high points on each of them. What we did here, I'm going to just talk about what this says is what the issues are and then the design issues. Right now I just want to talk about the design issues and I'll show you the actual results of uh, this study. Uh, and You can read these and ask me any questions, but the key thing we were trying to do for REACH is not add burden to the patients. So one particular thing, unlike most weight loss things, is we didn't require them to come in for additional visits or whatever. Okay, the intervention was either an automated or a cell phone uh, based intervention where they could do the, the phone thing. So, so that was one key thing that we were trying to do there. Um, for effectiveness, there, there's a number of uh, ways to do this. One, one thing that we did is there's a lot of good evidence that 
quote, expert system-based or computer-tailored interventions are better than non-tailored interventions. So you didn't have enough information, but this was a tailored intervention based on work that Gary Bennett had done before with inner-city African-American populations and things like that. So it was a, uh, an evidence-based program that was tailored. And then the other thing we did, which some people found controversial, but we felt was important, and actually we think may have increased a number of dimensions, was we allowed choice because of the issue you talked about. We wanted to use the technology, but we didn't want to just restrict it to people that had internet access at that time. Uh, so, so again, they had their choice, and they could use, and they could switch back and forth. And that drove some traditional trialists crazy. But we felt it was very interesting findings to see what happened about who chose. Again, the intervention was all the same, the tailoring was the same, the content, the theory, the algorithms were the same, but they could choose which one, or they could switch back and forth, particularly for entering their self-monitoring data. Um, and in terms of implementation, or excuse me, no, adoption. Um, why did I go out of this? One is we designed it with the staff. Okay, to do this. So instead of saying, hey, we've got this fully done intervention, do you want to adopt it or take it? We did it with them. We also purposely tried to really reduce the demand so we, in fact, didn't ask the physician to him or herself to do anything. But we largely uh, used the community health worker who they told us would see this as a, you know, enhancement, something that they'd be interested in in terms of, of doing that. Uh, quickly, uh, implementation uh, here, uh, a whole lot of things that we did, but the main thing that we tried to do, the two main things, is we tried to keep it low cost. And we actually did do, with Deb Ritzwaller, who was involved in this study, a cost assessment too, tried to minimize the cost. And then the second thing for implementation, a lesson learned with interactive technology, is we really kept it fresh. Again, this was largely Gary Bennett, but we know that people don't come back time after time to web-based or things if it's always the same. They get, you know, the tension span is, is an issue. And finally, on maintenance, um, the issue here, uh, one thing that we did being gluttons for punishment, this was a two-year overall kind of an ongoing, you know, it was low intensity, but an ongoing intervention because we knew what happens with relapse and things like that. So we, we, we looked and tried to make it easy for them to keep engaged for two years. And then the second thing is through the community health workers, we really tried to connect them with the social environment that was doing that would provide some ongoing support, be that YMCA or exercise programs or cooking classes or, or, or whatever to do that. So now let me uh, just go and then see if you have questions. Now for the results. Here's how we conceptualize things anyway. For REACH, there's both good and bad news. Uh, the first thing is they didn't offer it to as many people as we would have hoped. But again, this was real world reality. So I'd say we were not real happy. Only 60% were invited of the patients. Now again, not everybody's going to come in. If you come in with an emergency and you know, you're know you having a stroke or something, you're probably not going to be asked, hey, would you be interested in a weight loss intervention? But we would have hoped it was, it was higher than that. Um, on the other hand, and this is half empty, half full, 60% of the people who were approached did participate. And if you play with these numbers, that's actually pretty good relative, it's always compared to what is the question, you know, but that's actually not bad for, you know, a research study where we did have to consent people and everything like that. So we were moderately happy, but as you can see there, it wasn't totally representative about, about who participated. In terms of effectiveness, and there's a major typo here, we did get significant results uh, compared to the randomized control condition on both weight loss, but it was pretty modest. Okay, a couple of pounds or a little over one kilogram. Um, and this is a typo here, and I don't know why in the world this was here, but actually our best results were on blood pressure. We did get both systolic and diastolic blood pressure differences. Uh, again, they weren't uh, huge, but if you kind of look at the uh, projected savings or reductions, uh, they were about two and a half uh, milligrams of mercury systolic blood pressure at 12 months, and that increased to uh, almost four at 24 months. And if you did comparison just under blood pressure control, who was controlled versus didn't, uh, it actually was surprisingly large odds ratio of 1.5. 
So with, the, with this minimal uh, intervention there. Um, so those were the, the classic uh, measures. Fortunately, we didn't have uh, many. We did track unanticipated consequences or harms or things like that. And fortunately, those did not occur. Adoption now. Again, our definition was the sites or the clinics that we had, and then the staff within the clinics. So um, again, uh, first level center, good news, bad news. First of all, because we wanted to um, use to draw efficiently from patients to invite them an EHR, uh, only half of the clinics at that time, the community health centers, had EHRs, so they weren't invited. So that's a, a real deficit. The good news is, all three of the centers that did have EHRs were invited and they all participated. Uh, and we were also pretty happy at the staff level of the people who could do that. And these were the providers, again, not always a physician, sometimes it was a mid-level, but who was in charge. 19 out of 20 of them within these clinics who had a chance to participate did. Fairly happy with that. Implementation, again, we had several measures of there, but generally this uh, revolved around the community health worker. So the good news, good news, bad news. Good news is we felt that they had a fairly good high rate of these calls. It was a pretty aggressive protocol, I think 18 calls. So again, on average, a little over 70% of those were completed, and we felt that was an effective uh, com component uh, of it. And again, some, a lot of them completed more than 70%. Uh, per but again, there were some issues uh, related to that. As you can see, English speakers, it was in both English and Spanish, were, were more likely to uh, uh, to get uh, have their goals evaluated and, and that sort of thing. And finally, maintenance. I think that's my last slide. Yeah, let me go back. Well, I lost it. Anyway, on maintenance, we thought was one of the best, uh, well, no, I'm going to take it back. Again, good and bad. Individual level maintenance, this was out to two years with a really high risk, very low income population. And if anything, the, the key outcomes got better over time rather than worse. So we thought that was a, that, that was a win, uh, clearly for, for this population. The magnitude admittedly wasn't huge, but it was great. And also it generalized to some other patient report measures we had, and we also increased medication adherence as a result of uh, getting there. The bad news is that uh, when the study was over, despite the fact that they said they were into this and help us adopt it to do it, None of the three centers continued the, the intervention after it was over. Um, again, who, who knows a lot of reasons why, but that was probably our biggest disappointment. Should we call it? Do you want to, uh, with time, should we just call it or want a quick question or a comment? Just, can you reiterate and clarify for me um, the difference between the difference between reach and adoption for the individual participant? Yes. Um, again, with the caveat this is arbitrary, for the individual participant, we've tried, because this is inherently confusing, just said that's reach. For the individual, the end user, okay, in this case the, the person, the patient, the consumer, that's reach. Okay, and so there are issues about how many of them participated when invited, that sort of thing is, is reach. Um, Adoption in this study, as we def, uh, operationalized it, was the community health centers as the unit, the setting unit, and then the staff within the community health centers. But again, there are multiple targets there. So adoption is multi-level, but it's generally the setting or context and the people who are delivering the intervention. Does that, does that help? Yeah, and it's not, you usually, it's not um, variable with each study? It is, it, it is. is. And again, I often say, some of my colleagues who like to be more the re-aim police get upset about this, but sometimes I say it's the construct that's important. And in a way, what's important is you understand that we're looking at, it's kind of issues of generalizability at all these different levels. And so I don't really care that much myself, whether you call it reach or adoption, but just you know that there's setting that's important, there's staff involvement, and then there's the consumer level. All of those are important, and that, that's kind of the bottom line. Okay, thank you all. Oh, yes. 
Um, not at the end of this study. Uh, we should have, you're right, I concur, that's a weakness. We did formatively as we were developing the intervention. It was developed with staff and then with some patients that came in and did that too. So we asked them there. The one thing that was interesting, and then I will uh, get off of here, is that this issue, since they had the choice, that the patients voted with their feet. And the interesting thing was not a single person of the almost 200 people switched in terms of reporting their tracking data uh, from the phone, which we thought they'd have trouble with. They loved the phone. Not a single person switched from that to the web. But a lot of people switched, started on the web, but then switched to the phone to report their data. I think about 30% of the people. Well, thank you. So this is the last piece, and we're going to get to move around a bit um, so we can also uh, um, get our blood flowing and so forth as well. So you, we've gone through, um, let me get this up just very quickly. Okay, we've just completed sort of an application exercise to walk you through. We chose REAIM. But any of the frameworks and, um, that, that we've been talking about, it's the thought process of going through each kind of construct, thinking about it in terms of how it might influence the design of the intervention as well as your evaluation. That's what we hope you took away. And it takes practice and it takes discussion and thought more than we can accomplish in this exercise, but we wanted you to kind of practice and walk through the process. This last um, block of time is allowing you to self-select, as, as you are saying, Russ, you choose or vote with your feet, um, as to which area you might want to go a little bit more in depth on. And we have th uh, three tracks. So the first track will stay in this room. And it's more of a researcher track. So it's going to be Russ and Ross um, walking through um, tips for unraveling the black box, getting your DNI grant funded. Um, so you might want to choose this if you are really interested in improving your grantsmanship with DNI, you know, scientific type proposals. Okay, that will be in here. The second track is geared a little bit more towards uh, maybe the practice of DNI or clinical practice, and this is where, we'll, as Julie was alluding to earlier, we'll be going much more in depth around the CFER framework the, and how it's applied and, and, and so forth. Kind of like what we've discussed with REAIM, but going more in depth there. And I think it's very interesting to see how it's, it's really integrated with the operations of the site as well as the research and evaluation. So choose this if you're interested in learning more about this and its application perhaps in clinical quality improvement efforts.